Welcome and thank you for tuning in to episode 53 on the Healthy Runner podcast. And we are live within the Healthy Runner Facebook group talking about what type of diet is best for runners and what should I eat and drink during long runs with registered dietitian Jennifer Giles from Eat for Sport. So Jen is a board certified sports dietitian, speaker, writer, exercise, physiologist, triathlon coach, and RRCA running coach. Jen is passionate about performance nutrition, and she decided to specialize in it. So she has a double master's degree from Columbia University in nutrition and physiology. She's also an adjunct professor, and she owns a private sports nutrition practice for the past 23 years and works with athletes in all sports and of all abilities become better, stronger, and faster by optimizing their nutrition. So Jen believes that there is an athlete in everyone. And with sound training and proper fueling guidance, each athlete's true potential can be realized. So welcome to the show, Jen. Oh, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. It's my favorite topic to talk about. <laughs> yes, and it is a very popular topic within our community. So I'm sure this is gonna be very helpful for many of the runners in our community. So what Jen is going to do tonight, guys, she's going to educate us all about nutrition for runners and answer common questions like these. Is intermittent fasting good for runners? How long should I eat before running? What do I eat before runs? What are the best snacks to eat right after a run to recover? Do older runners need more protein? And how much water do I really need to drink? So for those of you who are jumping on the live within the Healthy Runner Facebook group, can you do me a favor and just comment live in the comment box below? And for those of you watching the replay, just comment replay, please. So Jen, we're going to get started with a nice little dynamic warm up, just like I'm sure you like to do before your runs. Absolutely. This is the first question we ask all of our guests. So tell us where are you from and what do you do? All right. Well, I am from Connecticut. I'm originally from New York, as we just talked about earlier, but I've been in Connecticut for about 20 years. And um, I have lived in many areas of Connecticut, but currently living in Ridgefield. Nice. And so I think you, we, had, we had spoke uh, offline before we jumped on here and you're originally from the box. And I said, I'm a big Yankee fan. So I feel like baseball's coming up. I think I mentioned it in the last podcast episode, how I'm a huge Yankee fan. Um, so it's good to hear that you're, you're close by, you're in Connecticut now, close to where I am. And we have a bunch of mutual friends within our healthy runner community. And everyone was very excited to see you uh, come on. So how long have you been a runner? I actually started running a, a little bit late in, in the game. Um, maybe to some people it's not late, but uh, I hated running growing up, believe it or not. I was, a, I was a softball player and a swimmer, but if you asked me to run, I would hide in the woods somewhere. I hated it. <laughs> so fast forward to be, I went to college and after the freshman 15 slash 40 um, for me, I decided to run. I saw some people running, I thought, you know what, I should just try it. So I grabbed a pair of running sneakers. I was actually on vacation and I just went out for a run. I thought, how hard could this be? And I lasted three fourths of a mile before I had to walk. <laughs> that's pretty common, right? Yeah. That's how, that's how everyone starts out. I, know. I was about 19 years old and I didn't know what I was doing. And, uh, I walked home like, you know, defeated, and, but I did go out the next day, ran a little bit more, ran a little bit more. And this is back in the day where I had a Timex watch. And in order to track my mileage, I had to drive my course afterwards and see how far I ran. <laughs> That's kind oh of how goodness. long ago that was. But, uh, but yeah, that was my moment. And I just, I kept running, I never stopped kind of like Forrest Gump. But after a couple months into it and I was slowly losing weight, which was nice, which is my goal originally, I just fell in love with it, you know, and it wasn't about the weight loss anymore. It was about, I love running. I kind of got that runner's high and, you know, it just, it was something that felt good and you felt free and alive. And even the bad runs felt good. You know, the good days felt great. The bad days felt great after they were done and you just wanted to keep going. But I did ask myself at some point during that first couple of months, I wonder if I changed my diet because my diet was not great, if it would make me a better runner. 
So I read everything and I runner's world magazine and whatever was around back then. And I just started making all these changes. And I realized like, wow, what I eat and drink does make me a better runner and does make me feel better. And I improved really so much so quickly and just began running longer distances, entering races, turned into like marathon running. I run 10 marathons, eventually turned into triathloning because I just thought, why not? (laughs) You needed the next level challenge. (laughs) Right. So did that for a long time. And yeah, I've been racing ever since. It's yeah, about just about 20 years. Uh, No, my running career will be 30 years next year in August. Wow. that that happened. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, no, I hope to be like you when I grow up someday. And (laughs) hopefully I will be running. I'm coming up actually on my 10 year run anniversary. Um, So I I got some, I got some years to catch up to you or try to catch up to you. All good. All in the same game, right? (laughs) Yeah. So what is your favorite distance now to run or is it triathloning? That's kind of your jam right now. I like it all. It's so hard when I get asked that question. I really do. Um, Right now, running wise, I would say half marathon is my favorite. I feel like just with schedule and life, I also have four kids. So with, and, and they're getting to the age where they're very, very busy and uh, training has, has been a lot easier for the shorter distances. The long distance training right now is, is difficult to fit in. So um, half marathons, I feel like it's a challenge. You, you can train for it, you can set a goal and you can do it and it doesn't overtake your life, you know, like a marathon would and an Ironman would. Um, and probably the same for triathlon, I would say Olympic distance right now is my favorite. It takes, it takes a solid amount of training to be good at it, but it's not overwhelming like the halves or the fulls are. Yeah, no, I agree. And actually you can see behind me, those of you who are listening on the podcast, you're going to have to check out the video version, but I just hung this, uh, bad boy up over here. Um, this was actually my Christmas gift, um, from my girls. And I had a bib and a metal holder, you know, at home, it's a like go daddy go, or, you know, run daddy run. Um, and it was getting a little full. So I needed a new one. And actually my wife surprised me. And this was a custom one that was made, um, which I absolutely love. But if you notice on it, there's the one <laughs> marathon race bib. I've only run one. And the reason uh-huh. is that, so that was in 2017. And I haven't run one since because of the time element, like you mentioned, yeah. like with my business, family, all that stuff. I think it is definitely a different ball game, uh, training for a marathon versus a half marathon. So it's definitely more attainable. I feel like it doesn't uh, take up as much time. So yeah, all these medals pretty much here are um, some half marathon medals. So those of you who are here on the live, let me know what you think of the new uh, the new background here. So Jen is the first to experience awesome. the new background of our lives. And let me give you a shout out to a bunch of people who jumped on here. Jean's here on the live, Kat's here. Billy, thank you so much for joining. Donna's here. Donna, I think you got a streak going. Thank you so much. Uh, you've been showing up every week. Uh, Adam's here on the live. Matt, so good to meet you today. Matt's here on the live. Marv is here. Longtime listener. Um, Lisa's here on the live. She is uh, so excited for this Healthy Runner broadcast. So I believe this is your friend, Lisa, um, who's here. Yeah. Hi, Lisa. And <laughs> Ethan is here on the live. Uh, Katie's here on the live. Trish is here. Twani is here on the live. I think she joined our community today just to see you as well. Uh, so thank you for joining us tonight. And Dina's here. Nivian's here. Um, yeah, you got a big turnout here. Everyone's excited about this topic. So let's get into this. Guys, if for those of you who are new, and this is your first time on Monday Night Spark Live here within the Healthy Runner Facebook group. So this is what we like to do. We like to keep it kind of conversational. I'm going to ask Jen a bunch of questions, but I'm going to also field some of your questions. So we love interacting with you, right? So we would like to not just make this a conversation between Jen and I, but also get you involved, answer your questions. Um, so we have the expert here. That's why she's here. That's why I brought her in. And I have some foundational nutrition knowledge based upon my kind of strength and conditioning certification. PT school, run coaching, but this is the true expert here, guys. This is like the highest level of sports nutrition expertise that we can bring on the show. So I'm super excited um, that you're here. So I'm going to get to the first question here, Jen. So what type of, all right, let me like preface this because we're coming off the holidays. We're coming off the, like for me, I know personally, and I'm sure, and actually I know from all of my clients that I've talked to these past couple of weeks is everyone slips off a little bit in terms of our nutrition. 
during November, during December, January hits and plus it's been a pandemic. So we're like, yeah, all right, how do we get back on track? So what type of diet is best for runners? Yeah, I love this question because it's very general. <laughs> and so I like to, there's really no one diet that's best for everyone. We're all so different. Our metabolisms are different. Our abilities are different. Our needs are different. So we, you really have to structure a diet that's specific to yourself. That's, that's really the best way to go about it because everyone, everyone has different health risk factors and everyone's training for different types of races. So in general, obviously you want to get all your, your nutrients and you want to make sure that it's whole food based and you're getting fruits and vegetables and lean, you get all your good stuff in. Right. But in terms of diet, quote unquote, that is like a written diet or, or in general, a diet that's called a diet, it should just be really healthy eating to support your, your training. That's the best way to go about it. Okay. So from what I got out of that is don't chase the latest fad diet, insert diet name into the equation there. Yeah. So kind of, all right. So this is good because this is the healthy runner podcast and the healthy runner Facebook community. So we're all about that, right? So we're all about health. So I already like, we have to say, and just before we kind of move on, I do want to get to a question before it slides by me. Um, Cause this I think is a good one. Um, this is from Adam here. And he says that if someone has Crohn's disease or Barrett's esoph esophagus, is esophagus, there we go. Esophagitis, I believe it is. Um, I have to be careful with fiber and sugar intake. Um, so what foods or meals can you recommend for distance runners for perhaps marathon distance or ultra um, marathons? Also has to be careful with fluid intake. So like no soda, coffee, alcohol, dairy. Um, so it sounds like he has a very specific question. And I know we're going to, that's going to kind of take us deep into the weeds here. But right. if you do have a kind of a, a quick response for Adam, before I forget to get to his uh, question, that'd be awesome. Yeah. I mean, I love this. This is a great example of really personalizing your nutrition because his needs are super specific. So if you're going to have to take out some fiber, which is going to give your GI tract a little bit of rest because fiber really makes your GI system work. And right now there's a lot of inflammation going on with Crohn's disease. So you want to decrease that inflammation and, and make your GI tract life a little easier for digestion. So taking out some of those five, some, some of the fiber in your diet which is choosing low fiber vegetables is a great way to do that. So to think about the fiber as like the crunchiness in your vegetables, like broccoli is crunchy, cauliflower is crunchy, a lot of fiber in those two vegetables. Choose softer vegetables, spinach, tomatoes, mushrooms, or cooked vegetables because their cooking decreases the amount of, breaks down the fiber. So that's one way to still get your fruits and vegetables and be healthy, but not overdo it in the fiber department. Um, most people, I would suggest increasing fruits and vegetables intake daily. I would, in his case, I would say just decrease them, still get them in every day, but decrease them and choose the lower fiber ones. And then in terms of, of fluids, I mean, I think it's great that you don't have to drink soda. I mean, it can't drink soda. That's awesome. <laughs> You're taking out some of the, um, inflammatory foods right out sugar, um, food colorings, uh, chemicals, uh, coffee, he said he also couldn't intake, right? Caffeine is, has a little inflammatory property. So you're taking those right off the bat. You're healthier, right, right off the bat from doing that. So that's great. Um, but like a, an example of a meal would be say like a high protein pasta. So like bonza pasta, it's higher, higher in protein than regular pasta. It's going to give you some more nutrients with some of those low fiber veggies and a lean protein. So I would say grilled, grilled salmon, for example, because it's, it's a good source of protein, but it's also high in omega threes, which will help decrease the inflammation in your GI tract. So that would be an example of a meal. Nice. Excellent. Yeah, no, that was great. You just dropped a lot of knowledge right there. I know. And <laughs> I threw out a one lot. thing. No, that was great. And so does that go that little trick about cooking your vegetables? If you're looking to decrease fiber, is that for like all vegetables pretty much like pretty you had much. like snap peas? Like I love snap peas yeah. uh, for a snack, but yeah. cooking them would produce a little bit less fiber, takes out some of the fiber in it. Yeah. And really the way to think about it is when we're eating, say I'm eating a raw snap pea, right? When I'm eating it, I'm digesting it. And there's all these digestive juices in your GI tract that are, that are digesting it. But if you're cooking it first, you're almost pre-digesting it. You're breaking the heat 
is breaking down some of those fibrous particles in the vegetables. So you're decreasing the fiber right off the bat. So yeah, raw vegetables tend to have more fiber than cooked vegetables in general. Nice. Excellent. No, excellent uh, description. I love it. Um, so Adam says, thank you, by the way. And, you're welcome, Adam. <laughs> and uh, Coach Lou's here on the live. And Marva says, thank you for the information. And Gene's a big fan of the uh, metal and bib holders. Awesome. Thanks, Gene. <laughs> um, so intermittent intermittent fasting. It's been something that I've heard um, a couple people do. Um, what is it about? And is intermittent fasting good for runners? Great question, because this comes under the umbrella of fad diets, right, that we were just talking about. So intermittent fasting has become popular, and it really is anywhere from fasting, and there's different versions of it, but fasting for eight hours, 12 hours, 14 hours, some people fast for 16 hours. And so what you're doing is you're decreasing the amount of, obviously, calories that you're intaking, because you're not eating for a certain amount of time. And what that does is it starts to biochemically break down other tissues. So your body needs to function, right? We need, we need glucose floating through our system in order to think and to move and to walk and to run and do anything we want to do. But if we're not, if we're decreasing the amount of glucose that's in your system, all of those energy pathways are not being fueled. So when we say you're going to fast 16 hours and then you go out and run, you're going to be behind the eight ball in terms of fueling. So in my opinion, I don't think it's a good strategy for runners. Um, another way to think of it is calories is a measurement of energy, right? So if we're decreasing our calories, we're decreasing our energy. And therefore when we're asking our body to run and need a lot of energy to do that, there's just not a lot there. So we're really undoing what we want to do. There's been some studies um, and I'm not crazy about the studies right now on intermittent fasting with diabetic athletes, that it improves some of their, their blood sugar responses, um, really small sample sizes and not, I think those, all those studies need to be repeatable, but uh, outside of that population of diabetic runners, it has not been proven to help with weight loss or performance. And therefore I'm just not really a fan of it. And all the people that I've worked with that has tried it, the, it doesn't make them feel good either. So anything that doesn't make you feel good is a red flag that maybe we should try something else. <laughs> right. I'm all so about whole, feeling good. Yeah, no, I, we need to feel good, right? Um, yeah. So the whole premise behind that is trying to really reduce calories, essentially, is the main premise behind the diet. Yeah, it's trying to control, um, minimize calorie intake and control overeating. And sometimes it backfires because when you fast for that long and then you're open the refrigerator door at hour 16, you're like, give me the food, <laughs> right? And so then you sometimes, a lot of times you end up overeating and over consuming calories in a smaller window instead of spreading it out throughout the day when your body really needs it. Yeah. And then you get hangry, right? Oh, and irritable. Yes. Then you snap at the kids, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> Yeah, you're not a good parent. You're not a good runner. Like nothing's working. <laughs> exactly. That's not a good thing. Um, so let's talk about in terms of running and scheduling your eating around running. So what you've kind of already educated us on is that nutrition is important for fuel in order to have energy for running, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't want to go out there and have a crappy run because you had no energy, right? right? We're not going to become better as runners from a performance standpoint and get that training effect that we need. So mm -hmm. let's talk timing and how long should I eat before running, let's say? Yeah. So if there's one takeaway from this whole talk, it's going to be timing. I think it's the number one import, most important thing to figure out for yourself when you need to eat in order to fuel your run the best way you can. And the answer again, is it's different for everyone. You, you know, textbook says 60 to 90 minutes before your run, you should eat a meal. Sometimes people eat a meal 90 minutes before the run and they're hungry 10 minutes before the run. And then they're decreasing their energy output because they don't have the, the caloric needs behind them. Right. So it's going to be, it's trial and error. I feel like most people in that 45 to 60 minute window is the best timing, but I work with many runners who eat 30 minutes before the run 
because they need that energy available. And it, it's based on metabolism too. So if you have a high metabolism and you eat 90 minutes before you run, most of that meal is gonna be digested before you go out to run, which A is a good thing because you won't have any GI upset, but B may be a bad thing because you won't have the energy available. Um, I also work with runners who eat 10 minutes before the run because they just need that top off of energy before they head out there. It also depends on what you eat. Right. So if you're going to eat like a big old turkey dinner, you need a lot of time to digest that before you run, or you're just going to eat like a banana and a yogurt that could be maybe 30 minutes before you run. But timing is key. And you really need to find out the timing that works for you and the foods that work for you that sit in your stomach the best before you run. And then once you find it, you'll know, cause you will feel again, it comes down to that feeling. You'll feel great. That's the answer. Yeah. And that's really what I found as being a novice runner in the beginning was the timing and it, it, you experimented, right? You, you tried things and that's the only way you were going to find out. Unfortunately, sometimes, you know, you, you don't have enough in the tank, uh, so to speak. And I find that a lot of the clients I work with from a run coaching standpoint, don't realize the importance of that fuel for their performance. And they're like, well, no, I always just, you know, run an empty stomach and, you know, like myself, I used to do that even before races. And then you finished a couple fast 5Ks, a couple fast 10Ks. And I was like loopy. And I'm like, all right, dude, you need to like actually eat something before you do these races. And now, you know, I always educate my clients on like the difference. And then once they actually have that fuel, like you said, like proper fuel, and there, it's like a world of a difference. So yes. if you are listening to this, this is going to be my public service announcement. <laughs> um, just reiterating what Jen talked about is if you are that mindset of like, no, I'm never going to eat for a run because I never do. And I never have. And, you know, you started in high school or college doing that. And I, I, I don't know if it does relate to biology of aging or not, but I feel like it makes a huge difference as we get older that you do need that fuel in order to really perform at the level that you want to perform. Yeah. All right. So we got a couple other questions here for you. I told you it was going to be a hot, hot topic here. Um, so uh, Trish says, now that I've been in full menopause for some time and on um, hormone therapy for a year, how do I balance getting enough carbs and protein to fuel my running while I am also trying to lose weight? It seems if I add carbs as my miles increase, I don't lose, but actually gain weight. Okay, good. So this is a great question. And there's so much more research coming out on menopausal women and runners now. It, there was never any research on it before. So we know a little bit more. I have a feeling in the next five to 10 years, we're going to know a ton more. But right now, what we know is we, we do need to shift things around because without estrogen, our metabolism start working differently. So she, so it's absolutely right that weight gain happens during menopause because we don't have that protection of estrogen that helps regulate your blood sugar and all the rest of it. So carbs really need to be managed. It wouldn't take carbs away because you still need them to run. You, that's the first energy source that your body uses when you head out for a run. But what I would do it is make sure that it's always consumed with a protein because what happens when you're eating carbs with a protein, it slows down the absor absorption, excuse me, of that carbohydrate into your bloodstream and it regulates it and keeps it nice and steady, which prevents weight gain. So that's kind of the key. Anytime you eat a carb, have it with a protein and that's going to help two things. It's going to help regulate your blood sugar, give you lots of energy, prevent cravings. But what's also going to do is it's going to prevent the storage of carbohydrate as fat, and it's going to make you better able to use it while you're working out. Nice. Great, great tip there. Um, so we do also have coach Luke's here. Uh, coach Whitney's here. Um, uh, coach Latoya is here. So Stacy is here. Oh, Stacy, oh so good to see you. Uh, Stacy. Yeah. I'm glad you're tuning in. Uh, great to see you on here. And uh, Whitney's glad she could listen for a little bit. All right. So we got another question here from Katie. So Katie is curious on your thoughts around fat adapted running. I have no clue what that is. So please educate me and our audience on if you know what fat adapted running is. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a long story short, it's really a way to train your body to utilize fat for energy instead of 
carbs for energy when we're running. So in a normal state, you or I would go out to run and the first thing your body pulls from is carbohydrates. So it'll look for any fleet, free flowing carbs in your blood, blood sugar, and it'll start burning off that. And when it starts burning off that at a high percentage, it's pulling along some fat with it and some protein with it. Everything gets burned when you're running, but it's the percentages of your nutrients that are getting burned that change while you're running. So you burn your carbs first, once you're a couple of miles in, then you're going to tap into fat, then you're going to tap into protein, right? Fat adapted running is teaching your body to actually pull from fat first. And the theory behind it is there's so many more calories to burn from fat so you can go longer. That's the theory. It doesn't always in, in reality work that way, however. So it's, it's similar to intermittent fasting actually, because what you're doing just physiologically, because what you're doing is you're creating, you're eating a higher fat, higher protein diet, and we're not able to release the blood glucose as easily over time. So while it would work in the beginning, it seems to work in the beginning, the studies that show that fat adapted diets, when it comes to weight loss, doesn't work any better than regular, well-rounded, balanced eating after about a year. So after a year into it, the results are going to be the same. And typically it's not a sustainable diet because we're not eating enough carbs and, you know, food and mood connection isn't there. So people tend to get a little bit down, depressed. There's some links to that. I'm not saying that happens to everybody, but there has been links to that. So I kind of usually steer people away from that because I feel like your body wants to, to burn carbohydrates as fuel first as runners. It's the most efficient fuel we have, much more efficient than fat. And we can burn just as much fat if we have a balanced diet and eating all those, eating all those foods in the right um, balance percentages. And would you say you're kind of alluding to it with, with this uh, specific diet, but is that why like all diets, number one, like they sell, people buy them is because people get like really fast results quickly, but there really isn't the long-term data to support the use of these diets and the body does adapt quickly to anything that's like completely different than what they're yeah. used to. Oh yeah. Anytime you do something different, your body's going to go, Whoa, what's different. And it's going to start, you know, reacting. But after a certain time, you, you said it, you adapt, your body adapts and it's like, okay, this isn't really working for me. And then you stop the weight loss or you stop the performance gains. And the funny thing is back in the days where we did like the South beach diet, they're all really the same. They're just repackaged, right? South beach or Atkins or all those diets, similar diets are doing the same thing. Um, we were finding that people, either it's not sustainable. So you just can't do it for a long period of time and you can't, you know, expect for a long period of time, not to eat any carbs, you know, especially if you're going traveling or if you're going to a party or a wedding or it's just it's not sustainable but it's also not making people feel good at the end of the day and there were so many other issues like low energy availability or like um um obviously poor performance games or actually stress fractures because we weren't getting enough nutrients in absorption rate so there's a lot of negatives to all those but at the end of the day yes um i'm making a very <laughs> A short question longer with my answer. But yeah, we love quick results. We all love quick, quick results, right? And when something's working or worked for your friend or your running partner, you're going to try it. But it's it's kind of a mind game. I mean, and, and you know what? It's, a, it's human nature to want those results too. Trust me, I've been doing this for a long time. I walk into some vitamin stores sometimes and they promise me I'm going to like win Ironman next year with their big brochures of, you know, awesome athletes. And I'm like, Oh, I should buy that. Cause I think it's going to make me win Ironman. And then I'm like, I have to smack myself and say, no, no, <laughs> just trying to tell me something that probably doesn't work. And yeah. I always say too, like, if it worked, then we would all be fast runners and, and all never have to worry about weight gain. And that's not true. Clearly. Yep. Yeah. And I think the important part is, you know, for really our, our discussion is this isn't just a weight loss kind of podcast, right? We're talking about weight loss, but we are runners and that's what we love to do, right? We want to run. We love running. We want to challenge ourselves. We want to perform better. We want to get faster, right? Like everyone tells me all the time they want to get faster. And it seems that if you're really trying to do one of these fad diets, 
that's counterproductive to really meeting your goal to run faster and or run for the long run, <laughs> pun intended, right? And not get a stress fracture so you can feel good about yourself, right? We all need to run for mental sanity right now, right? That's the biggest thing we need to run. And if you're not fueling properly and you're doing one of these diets, then I don't see that being successful for your long-term running. Yeah, or um, your health overall too. Yeah, if we're not healthy, we can't run. So we want to prioritize health above everything else. Indeed. Um, so uh, Katie, thank you so much for your question. It's a great question. And Lisa Wheeler is giving you a little testimonial here. She <laughs> says, my nutrition during races and my recovery pre and post Jen's nutritional advice is profound. So she's yeah, giving you a little shout out there. Athlete. Yeah, she did all the work and she really nailed her nutrition and it pays off. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, so Jean says, uh, that's me after a super long shift. So Jean's a nurse. Um, she has long shifts. And when she gets home, she says she eats like a bear going into hibernation. It's bad. <laughs> so I think kind of talking about that, you know, feast or famine and, you know, definitely like the frontline healthcare workers right now. Um, I can't imagine they're probably not able to eat for hours and hours and hours um, with all the COVID precautions. So I think that's, that's probably a challenge. Do you have any advice? I don't know if you have any clients who are needing to go those long periods of time. Like, is there better foods maybe that can prevent like Jean's scenario where she gets like off her shift and now she's like just starving to death. And now she like eats everything and then just goes to bed. Right. Yeah, do you have any yeah. advice to that? I do. I love this question. I happen to be married to an ER doctor. So I, I this comes up every single day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Because of that, I do work with a lot of shift workers, night shift workers, day, long day shift workers, nurses, doctors. Um, yeah, it's tough. I'm not going to say it's easy because it's not, but most of these workers can eat during the day. It, they just have to take two or three more steps than the rest of us would. They have to remove themselves from the working environment, find a little, like either they have the locker room or they have a little kitchen or kitchenette or whatever. There are places for them, but sometimes they're so busy they can't sneak away. But I'm going to go back to my original statement earlier in this and say, if you're eating protein and carbohydrate together, that's going to sustain you for longer. So you can have these small snacks throughout the day, every three or four hours throughout the whole day and regulate your blood sugar so that you're not famished when you get home, because that's what you don't want. You don't want that to intake all your calories at the end of your day, you actually need your calories during your day when you're the most busy and need the most energy. So that's key. But, um, but then to answer your question about certain products, and I think that you, you are, you can fan too. There are certain products that help regulate your blood sugar and you can, which is a sports nutrition drink. They have bars now too, but it, that works in the same way that combining foods work. So you can combine protein and carbohydrate to regulate your blood sugar. You could use a product like you can to regulate your blood sugar and that you would just have to drink that throughout the day. I have many shift workers that use you can because of that purpose. And then you'll get off your shift and you'll be hungry, but you won't be famished. And then you can eat a balanced meal. But I think planning also on the front end of that is eating before your shift. So if you're eating a good meal going into your shift and then you have two or three snacks during your shift, small snacks to manage that blood sugar and then have a whole meal after. So it's all about timing, just like running is, shift working is always about timing those nutrients throughout the day. Oh, excellent advice, excellent advice. Yeah, so hopefully Gene, that's helpful for you. And Stacy, I'm sure that would be helpful for you as well. Uh, Shauna, thank you so much for joining the live. Um, and yeah, Jean says, uh, planning, she tries to make a wrap with chicken. So it's quick and yogurt with fruit and granola. So that's kind of what she's, uh, she's doing there. And yeah, for those perfect. of you that, for those of you that don't know, um, and aren't familiar with you can products for those of you listening on the healthy runner podcast or within our Facebook community, you can always use your discount code, um, healthy runner. Um, at checkout for you can we have had um, Matt Bach uh, on previous podcast episode um, in the 20s there if you're scrolling back on the podcast check out Matt's episode he did a great job at talking about the importance of you can and for especially those long runs especially for those races so now that we've turned the page in the calendar hopefully we can uh, think about some virtual maybe half marathons first and hopefully maybe some in-person 
uh, half marathons or marathons, maybe next fall in 2021, fingers crossed um, that we can, we can uh, get there. All right. So let's get into, you kind of mentioned a little bit types of food, but what, what do you usually recommend? Let's say you have a novice runner who's just starting out and they're like, Jen, what do I have before my runs? Like what type of food should I eat before my runs? What do you say to them? I usually start out with basic neutral foods that are easy on your stomach, just easy to to digest, sits well in your stomach, nothing too crazy. Something like an oatmeal. Oatmeal is great because that goes along with what we've been talking about. It's a slow release carbohydrate that doesn't spike your blood sugar. So that's a great food to incorporate for beginner beginner runners. Um, You can even add stuff to that. You can add nuts for a little bit of protein and good fats, or you could add some berries just to bulk it up a little bit or slice bananas, but oatmeal will be a good place to start. Um, another food pre run I love is eggs, either scrambled eggs or a hard boiled egg. If you're just running out the door, you can grab it and eat it really neutral on the stomach and a lot of nutrients in there. Now that's mostly fat and protein. So I would add a little carbohydrate to that. Um, even slice it up and put it in a wrap or put it on a piece of whole grain toast so that you get that carbohydrate protein ratio going on. Um, Another pre-run meal that's nice and neutral would be a banana and a Greek yogurt. Tons of protein, good sources of carbs, lots of micronutrients, especially potassium in there that can help foster your energy release for your run. Those are kind of three good examples of good place to start. Those are my staples. And that's, that's the one thing I discovered within the last three years was really oatmeal. That's been a game changer for me, um, for my races and even now my long runs, like even yesterday, um, I'm just starting to build back up, but I just ran six, but I woke up and pretty much like two and a half hours before my digestion is a little slower. So I'll usually have oatmeal like two and a half hours before, but then if I'm doing a race, like a banana an hour before, um, and I will do a little bit of my plant-based protein, um, for someone who is selfishly, um, who is non-dairy, are there any specific protein sources that you recommend for your non-dairy, um, runners? Yeah. Um, like a protein powder, you mean like a supplement or food or supplement? Um, okay. yeah. cause I know the importance of protein and you were talking about that before at really taking that with your carb to kind of maintain. So are there some good examples if someone is non-dairy and they, um, can't have milk, they can have yogurt. Um, and maybe even, I know some people are sensitive with eggs, um, and they can't do an egg. Right. Any other yeah. options? Yeah. Tofu. Great option. Um, it's a whole, it's a soy based protein, vegetable based protein, and you can make a million things. You can do a tofu scramble in the morning, or you could put silk in tofu, tofu in a smoothie. And that way you're boosting the protein content. Um, to the same note, another soy product would be edamame. So it's super high in protein and carbohydrates. So that's a two in one. You don't even need to combine those two nutrients because they're both there. Um, peanut butter and nuts, great sources of protein that also have healthy fat in them. So now you're getting a um, good source of omega-3s in both of those foods. And um, there are some actually other non-dairy yogurts, but some of those tend to not be so high in protein. So you'd have to check your labels on that. But if they weren't, if they weren't high in protein, you could always add like a vegetable-based protein powder to them and even just stir it in or make a smoothie out of it. And um, that would be like a pea protein or a hemp protein would be a good alternative to some of the other dairy proteins. Excellent. Yes. Happen. Yeah, that's what I do. I do my plant-based protein. So I'll do some of that with some coconut milk. Um, and even this morning, as I was making a little video about this uh, tonight's episode, after my workouts, I always have my little plant-based protein with an apple. Um, ah. Is that is that a good post-workout or post-run carb to have an apple? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Any fruit, any fruit is going to be a great, as long as it comes along with the protein, because you want to recover the muscle breakdown and the glycogen depletion at the same time. So yes, apple and peanut butter, apple and um, protein smoothie. Um, You know what I love too, is a flax milk and it's, it's, Mm -hmm. they make flax milk without protein and they make one that's protein fortified too. I think that's a great after post run, especially you can, they make them in those little boxes too. So you can throw them in your gym bag or in your car and just swig one down if you're not at home after your run. So that makes it a little bit more convenient, but yeah, all really good choices for post run. And the same goes for post run as it does for pre run. You want to combine protein and carbohydrates so that you can 
recover as optimally as possible. In general, right? Really like every meal, right? Every you, meal. you do want to try, like if you're an athlete and your, your goal is to get stronger and you want to build muscle, like protein is the building blocks of muscles, right? So in general, that's what we should shoot for. Yeah. Yeah. And our protein ne needs we're finding more and more are much higher than we ever thought they were as runners, because we have so much protein breakdown every day. I mean, we're hitting the pavement and those protein um, cells are breaking down and that's for a good reason because they rebuild and that's how we get stronger and faster and better. Right. But if the, the, um, nutrients, the raw nutrients underneath are not there, they're not available, then we can't build the protein as efficiently as we could if we had all the raw nutrients there. So that's really the argument behind eating protein and carbohydrates every single meal. So it's always there to turn over that protein breakdown. Yes. Yes. Oh man. I need to play that for my daughter. So I have a teenage daughter and she is the carb lover of the family. So she will have pasta like every meal if she was allowed to, like, that's literally all she would. Sometimes I see her double dipping pasta with pasta. So we'll have like pasta with butter, pasta. maybe some mac and cheese. And I'm like, you have two different dishes here. They're both pasta. Like, yeah, yeah, we have to like twist her arm to get her protein. And my other daughter though, she loves chicken. She loves protein. So she's like our, our meat eater. Right? Um, yeah. So, but I'm going to have to play that for her. So Try Whitney the bonza did... pasta with her. Ask her if she likes that bonza pasta. It's a, it's a chickpea pasta and they make, there's so many other brands too out there that are made from different beans, but they're higher in protein and they taste really good. And kids hardly know it. My kids don't know it unless I told them. <laughs> Excellent. I'm going to just sneak that in there. All right. That's a good tip. We're going to have to check that out. Uh, so Whitney agrees with, she loves oatmeal um, pre-run. Uh, Coach Latoya also agrees. She says oatmeal for the win, raisins, pecans, and cinnamon. Yeah. Uh, that's what she goes with. And um, Latoya says plant-based runner here. Again, tofu, so good. And Jolene is here on the live. Jolene, so good to see you, man. We got all, all your friends here. We got Stacy, right. Jolene. It's been a, it's been a while guys. So thanks. Uh, <laughs> Jolene says, thanks for thinking of us non-dairy runners, uh, miss having chocolate milk as a post recovery drink. I know a lot of runners do love the chocolate milk after. Yeah. Uh, chocolate after soy race. milk. I would go with chocolate soy milk. It's delicious. Yeah. And, uh, Stacy says, love Adamami. Yeah. The Scotty family. Oh. Big oh, fans of Adamami, okay. especially we haven't been able to go since uh, COVID, but Hibachi, like every time yeah. we go out to Hibachi, we get the Adamami. You have to, yeah. right? Yeah. little but, sea salt on top. Yum. All right. So Coach Cat says, what about a smoothie made with a protein carb powder like you can, almond milk and peanut butter before a run? I can't eat bananas and oatmeal doesn't agree with me. Mm -hmm. LOL. <laughs> yeah, this goes back to you have to find out what works for you. You know, the foods that you like to eat, if you don't like it, then you're not going to do it. So you want got to make sure that you find enough meals and snacks that you enjoy so that you actually eat them. And so it works for you. So yeah, if you don't like those foods, you got to find something that works. But yeah, take the banana out of there if you don't like it and just make a smoothie with the foods that you like, as long as it's protein and carbs, and it's, which is usually either a protein powder, a milk, and um a fruit of some sort, another frozen fruit, strawberries, peaches, something like that. But that's perfect. Plus that increases your fluid intake before you run, which is going to increase hydration. So that's a great idea. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, Whitney says chocolate milk post run for dairy users. That's her go-to smiley face. And um, Adam says oatmeal with creamy peanut butter. Uh, Matt says uh, chocolate milk, fair life core power is the best post drink run for us. Um, and that's coming from a dairy farmer. So Matt, Matt <laughs> knows <it>. best. <laughs> Matt knows it. best. Um, the runners know what they're doing. This is great. Yeah, this is what we do in this community, but you're sharing a lot of good stuff. So I have some more questions for you because yeah. some of the stuff we haven't talked about on the podcast uh, before. How about this? This should probably be a pretty quick one. What are the best snacks to eat after a run to recover? Okay. I feel like we could kind of answer this because people were asking about, but like smoothies, I'm a big fan of smoothies because they're just easy and you can get a lot of stuff in there. You could also go crazy and throw things like spinach leaves or um, other greens, like mixed greens, power, super greens, power greens to get your micronutrients in there. Um, 
a frozen fruit, banana if you like it, um, and a milk. And then you're getting all, not only are you getting protein, carbohydrates, and sometimes I will even throw some avocado in there too to get your healthy fats and decrease inflammation after a run. So that's key. But I love also simple things like peanut butter sandwich, because now you're getting your carbs, protein, and healthy fat, right? See how we're going? Um, or leftovers from dinner the night before, chicken, rice, and veggies with a little maybe olive oil to add your healthy fat. So you're getting, again, the anti-inflammatories. If you're combining nutrients, anything is a go after your run, because you, that's all you need is you need the protein and carbs, healthy fat, if you can grab it in there, and then that's a perfect post-snack. So something easy, or you can do something more complex, like a meal, if it's meal time, or just depending on the timing of your run and your day. Perfect. So it gives me more of a reason to have my daughter make her delicious homemade guac after mm -hmm. my runs to get those healthy Lucky. fats in there. <laughs> and that's the, uh, that's the pasta uh, lover. She does make a mean guac. Okay. So. <laughs> I like it. There's hope for her yet. <laughs> so do older runners need more protein? Absolutely. And I mentioned this before, but we're learning in science that um, with more studies that come out that as we're aging, well, we always kind of knew this, as we age, we lose lean muscle mass. It's just the name of the game. Every decade you're losing about 10%. So to offset that, because we're all fighting the aging game, right? Is we need to increase our protein, increase your exercise. So we're running weight bearing exercise and strength training. So if we have all those three combinations, then we can offset the 10% loss per decade and Whenever you're strengthening your muscle mass, you're strengthening your bone mass because bones and muscles are connected, right? And then we can offset things like fractures, or broken hips, um, osteoporosis, those type of things. But yes, we do need more protein. And as runners, because we have that daily breakdown of muscle every single day, they're really upping the requirements from, it used to be 0.8 grams per kilogram. Now it's 1.2 grams per kilogram. Um, which is a lot more than we thought. So we really need a lot more protein than we originally thought. And again, you can easily get it in as long as you're getting protein at every meal and snack. And in general, if you're getting about 20 grams per meal and snack, you're going to pretty much hit that mark. Okay. So that, yeah, is more of a reason to get your protein intake guys. And especially like, I can't even stress that enough you know, earlier in my career, when I kind of worked in kind of general outpatient orthopedics and how many patients that I would see with fractured hips, um, osteoporosis, um, all of those things. And really, as we start to age, you know, if you have a fall and you fracture your hip, um, unfortunately, that is the beginning of a, a usually a pretty rapid decline. Um, in your ability to be independent, for you to be able to walk without a device, for you to be independent living in your home. So not only is weight-bearing exercise, so that's why running is great because it is a weight-bearing exercise, but I completely agree with Jen's point on strength training. Um, it is so important for the aging runner. And sometimes we feel at when we age, we, we might feel the way, maybe if you strength trained when you were younger, and you hit the gym and you're like, well, I'm too old for that. I'm going to get hurt. Or so that's not true. And we know that aging um, athletes are, are, it's very beneficial and protective for their body to strength train. So if this is not, if this is your first episode that you're listening to on the podcast, um, we pretty much touch upon strength training and most other podcasts. So check out uh, some of those episodes. And if you're looking for guidance, we have the Healthy Runner Strength Program. So shoot me a message. I'll be uh, happy to share the details of that. If you're looking for the structure and the plan and knowing what you should do as a runner to strength train. But I couldn't agree with you more, Jen. Like strength training, super important. And now you're also adding in the fact of protein intake and making sure that we're getting enough protein intake. So thank you for sharing that point. Um, I think it's a great point. And many of our listeners are really in that situation. That's really what we're dealing with on a daily basis. So I hope you guys uh, took home that important point. All right. So as we're talking here, I'm drinking my water. How much water do I really need to drink? Oh my. <laughs> yeah. So this is a super important question because hydration is 
almost as important, if not more important than nutrition, believe it or not, it is so important. We're, we're made mostly of water, right? General recommendations are half your body weight in ounces. So if you weigh 150, you want to drink 75 ounces of water a day. And ideally, the best way to go about that is to spread that out throughout the whole day. Now, the trick is, and this is where individualization comes in, is if you're only drinking 20 ounces of water a day right now, I don't want you drinking 75 ounces tomorrow because it's you're not going to feel good. <laughs> it's, you're going to be waterlogged and your body's not going to be used to it. So just baby step it up a little bit and drink more and more. And it doesn't have to be water. It could be seltzer. It could be decaf tea. It could be um, a little bit of water with juice just to flavor it up. I have true lemon tonight just because I love it. The little packets of true lemon and put them in your water. They're crystallized lemon. There's no sugar calories or anything in them, but it sweetens up. It makes your water taste a little good, a little better. You could do fruit infused water. Like you could just make it a little more creative if you're somebody that doesn't like water. Um, and if you're a big coffee drinker, you could be getting a little bit more dehydrated. Um, big coffee drinker, I mean like more than three cups a day because caffeine is a diuretic. It can actually dehydrate you. One or two cups usually doesn't offset your hydration status. But the other thing to remember is some people are really heavy sweaters. So if you're a super heavy sweater and you kind of know that if you go out for a run and you ever get like that salty gritty feeling on your face or you see salt marks on your clothes or your hat, it kind of, that means you're actually losing a lot of electrolytes in your sweat, which isn't a bad thing. It just means you need to take in more water and be really cognizant of your electrolyte intake too. So water and electrolytes go hand in hand. So I, I have a lot of runners come to me and they say, well, I'm drinking two gallons of water a day. And I say, okay, let's look at your sweat rate. Let's look at your body weight. Let's decide if that's a good idea because if you're over drinking, if you're drinking too much water, you can actually be diluting your bloodstream of electrolytes and interfering with proper hydration. So it's a balance between water and hydration and you really start that equation by figuring out your sweat rate. And, um, and there's some other issues like, are you a distance runner? Cause that'll, that'll be a factor in how much fluid you're losing every day. Or do you live in a really warm climate and are you losing um, fluids just walking around because you're sweating more or, or a humid climate? There's a lot of different factors, but in general, I start with half your body weight in ounces. And then we look at what you're currently doing right now. And we either increase or decrease that depending on your lifestyle. Great tip. I've never heard of that before. So that's a nice, simple uh, way to explain that. So I think that would be very helpful. Um, and uh, Valeria says uh, that it is great to see you and hear from you, Jen. It's been so long oh. and she just joined our community. So oh, she's Valeria, excited. You. <laughs> she's excited to be here. And uh, she also adds that she's found it very helpful to um, up her salt intake. So for example, like a single serving bag of chips the night before a half marathon to hold onto water on race day. Is this okay? 100%. And Valeria is a physical therapist also, by the way. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Shout out PT. Nice. Love um, it. Yeah. So this is an awesome question and super timely because so electrolytes, what I was just talking about is sodium. The biggest one is sodium. The other ones are potassium, magnesium, calcium. There's some other ones, but you'll see that those four are kind of your main players. And what they do is they bring the water into your cells. They act like a little pump and they pump water from your blood into your cells. So if you, you could drink water all day long and you, it will pass through your body unless you have proper electrolytes to actually absorb that into your muscles. So you want, the goal is to get the water into your muscles, not to just keep water in your, in your GI tract. That's what we want. And sodium, increasing sodium does that. So yes, you can do it with a salty snack, like pretzels, chips, pickles, um, broth-based soup is a good way to do that, natural foods, or you can do it with a supplement. So there's like noon tablets, Zim tablets, there's base performance salts. There's so many salt, you can make a hydration packet there's so many different um, brands out there right now, but they all pretty much do the same thing in terms of they have, they have the same electrolyte profile that will optimally hydrate you and keep you hydrated. And yes, for long runs, you want to have a little bit of sodium in your diet along with the water before you head out for your run so that you're hydrated when you start. So that you're not behind the eight ball. If you're dehydrated before you start a long run, you're behind the eight ball before you start. And it's very hard to catch up. But if you're optimally hydrated and you start running and then just top it off with a little handheld water, then you can actually maintain your hydration 
And the benefit to that is maintaining your pace throughout the whole run. And that's what we're after in the long run anyway, right? So yes, salt Indeed. helps for sure. Indeed, that's great. Thank you so much. And I, I'm pretty sure that we did cover this um, before, but is there any, just because I feel like we have a, a lot of runners in our community that might be going through menopause um, right now. And we really haven't talked about this before on the show. And I know before you had shared um, with our listener question about combining carbs and protein um, because of hormone levels. Is there any other specific dietary needs um, that someone may need as they go through menopause or following menopause? Yeah, for sure. And this is what we're learning more and more about. But um, so protein needs increase during menopause because our muscle breakdown is happening a little bit faster because of the lack of estrogen. So now we're finding that women, especially athletes, women athletes need almost 30 grams of protein every time we eat closer to 30 grams where normal non-menopausal women can, can get away with 20 to 25 and be fine. But we need to up that to 30 which is hard to do, it's not easy. So it takes a lot of thought, it takes a little bit more planning. And I think that's where we're missing the ball and we don't, we don't get enough because we're not planning and preparing. So to make that easier, I would just say, um, maybe a supplement is good, a protein supplement. You know, I'm not a huge supplement person, but I think if we're, we need that much protein and how many chicken breasts can you eat every day, then a supplement <laughs> might be a good idea to get that in a smoothie or some other way. And we're not, our metabolism start to slow down because of loss of, of estrogen also. So we're not burning through all that carbohydrates as we normally would as runners. So decreasing that protein to carbohydrate ratio is typically a good idea for menopausal runners. So a little bit less protein, I mean, a little less carbs, a little more protein than we normally would do. Um, that way we can still eat carbs and enjoy them, but we're just getting less of them. And then lastly, we don't need as many calories because our metabolisms are lower. Even when we're running, they're still a little bit lower than when, when they were, assuming that you're running training schedules pretty much the same. So overall, we need a little bit less, um, especially we're finding in the evening time before we go to bed. So this is not necessarily different than every other time in our lives. We should kind of be eating when our bodies are using the most calories during the day when we're most active and need the most energy and less in the evenings. I think we get so busy that sometimes life just doesn't work that way. But when you're menopausal, you really need to be more cognizant of decreasing calories in the evening at hours and in increasing calories during the day. And that way you can increase me metabolic rate a little bit better. Excellent. Great tips. Oh my goodness. This is so helpful. Um, so we are in the final stretch right now. So if you could change one thing about the misconception of nutrition for runners or dieting in general, what would that be? Uh, this is such a good question. Um, I think I would go back to just saying that there's no magic pill or potion or powder to make anybody better, faster, stronger. It's, or or there's no superfood or there's no magic diet like this. There's no one quick fix. It's a combination of all these different things that we've talked about tonight and consistently over time, that's what makes you a better runner. And I wish that in the media, we would, that would be cooler. You know, like right now it's super cool to try the new drink or the bolt energy drink or all this caffeine, whatever, you know, all the cool stuff with the fun labels, but healthy balanced diet consistently over a long period of time it's not that cool, <laughs> but it's the thing that works the best, which is so ironic, but I think that's, that's what I would love to change. Oh, just gold guys. This is gold for your ears. Hopefully you guys are taking this in. Um, so I am sure there are going to be many runners who learned something today from you. And I know I did, and, and they would like to learn more. So how can they learn more or find more about how you help runners? Yeah. So, um, you can always find me on social media. I'm on Instagram at Jen Giles eat for sport. I'm also on Facebook, same handle, Jen Giles eat for sport and all the other ones, Twitter. I'm even on TikTok. I started TikTok. Yes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh we were talking about that, uh, last week's episode with Harrison. Oh, yeah? you know, they have a TikTok as well. I do as well. And yeah, I, I'm not real consistent on it because it takes a little too much time, but I have some good family TikToks on there and family cool. dances, but I'm going to have to, 
Yeah, I'm gonna have to connect with you on TikTok as well. And I know you had mentioned, do you have a specific like self-assessment that folks can fill out? And and what is that? I do, yeah. So pretty much everyone I start with, I just have them take a little inventory of themselves. What are you doing great? What are you not doing so well? What have you not even considered? And it's kind of like a checklist and you just go through it and it's a way to prioritize what to work on first. So if I have somebody who's already great in the vegetable and fruit department, I'm not gonna start telling them to eat vegetables and fruits. I'm gonna start with maybe increasing their protein because they're not doing that so well. Or what other, but there's, it's a series of the most prioritizing habits as a runner, as an athlete that you can do. And it's a self-assessment. And I can make that available for your listeners if you would like the link to that. That would be phenomenal. So actually, for those of you who are here on the Facebook Live, if you want this free self-assessment, just drop self-assessment into the comment box and uh, Jen or I will be sure to get that to you. And if you are listening to this on the podcast or the Spark Your Training YouTube channel, check the show notes. I will add the link in the show notes and you can go ahead and get your uh, self-assessment on. All right. So I, Dina says, uh, wow, wow. She's learned so much today. And thank you so much for the excellent questions. Uh, she says she took notes. Um, she's Good. thankful. Marva agrees. She said, I sure did learn a lot. Thanks guys. Uh, Trish says great information. Thank you so much. And so does, uh, Latoya. And so if you guys learned anything today, if you can do Jen and I a favor, hit that like, hit the love button. If you're listening to this on Facebook, it will just help this show up. So there can actually be good quality evidence-based like information that Jen shared with us today versus all of the fad diet stuff that probably pops up in all of your news feeds. So let's get some good quality nutrition information out to more runners and by you, throwing those hearts down, uh, that will help it show up. So thank you so much, Jen. This was like, this was amazing. Like we definitely have to have you on again, first off. Um, oh, I would love to. This is not going to be a one and done. This yeah. was very, very helpful. Um, thank you for taking awesome. the time. Oh, all my pleasure. It was such fun listeners. And it was just a treat to be on here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is great. And guys, remember this Thursday, our team healthy runner half marathon program launches. If you would like to get your running spark back this spring and run 13.1 again, even if it's virtual, join our coaching crew and get the run plan, the exercises, the structure and the community support to get back in running shape. So we will be sharing much of Honestly, a lot of nutrition chip, uh, tips that Jen shared in this episode with our community of runners getting after it um, with our special live trainings from our coaching team. So if you want to be the first to know about the program, just comment team into the comment box. If you're listening to us on Facebook and those listening on the podcast, check out the show notes. I'm going to drop the link in there for you. So our podcast drops every Thursday. So that will be the first day that the program is open. And you can uh, get in so you can run 13.1 this spring. So thanks again, guys, who jumped on Facebook. Thank you if you're watching on the At Spark Your Training YouTube channel or if you're listening to this on the podcast. Remember, every Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we go live within the Healthy Runner Facebook group. So keep us in mind in your schedule so you can get your questions answered. Thank you again. And remember, stay active, stay healthy, and just keep running. Until next time. Thanks again, Jen. I appreciate Thank you it. Thank very much. Bye, everyone.